Well, good evening to you. So good to see you. Appreciate your presence here, members and visitors alike. We're so thankful to be together to worship God. I invite you to take your Bibles out and be open them to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. John 19, and notice with me verse 38. John 19, 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. It's interesting, Joseph of Arimathea is mentioned at the conclusion, or near the conclusion, of all four gospel accounts. You'll find uh, him in Matthew 27, 57. You'll find him in Mark 15, 43, Luke 23, 50 and 51, and here in John 19, near the end of that chapter. And when you look at all those scriptures, those New Testament scriptures, they reveal to us that Joseph of Arimathea was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin Council. He's also described that he, in, the, in the text to us that he was a good and just man who also waited for the coming of the kingdom that had been prophesied, of course, in the Old Testament. Furthermore, he did not consent to the Lord's crucifixion. All those things we learn from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, looking them together, However, we're also informed about this man in John's account that he kept his discipleship a secret from others. I want to ask you tonight, are you a secret disciple? Are you a secret disciple of Jesus Christ? You know, we, we read in Matthew's account about Joseph in chapter 27 and verse 57 that Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. Now, Matthew didn't, doesn't mention, but he was a secret disciple. Matthew says that Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple. But again, no one other than Jesus and perhaps his own family knew that about him, that he was a disciple of Jesus. And I wonder, could the same be said of us? That we became a Christian, that we obeyed the gospel, that we're baptized into Christ, that we are a follower of Jesus, but no one other than our physical family and our church family, our spiritual family, really know that about us. That those at school, those in the workplace, those in the, if you go to the gym, those in the community, and etc., are not aware that you or I am a follower of, of Jesus Christ. Is that, is that true of any of us? You think about a disciple and what that means. A disciple is defined sometimes as a pupil, a student, a follower, right? a follower of a teacher, and in this case, a follower of the teacher, the master teacher, Jesus himself. And also, it's, it's a disciple is one who adheres to the teachings of another and is striving to be more like the teacher, his master. But discipleship is something to be done. It's something to be lived. You think about what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24 about discipleship. And you know it's something that is to be done. It's something that is to be lived. We read in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, those who are already following him, those who are pupils of his, sitting at his feet, learning from him day after day, he says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I want us to think about this, young and old tonight. Are you a secret disciple like Joseph of Arimathea was for a period of time? So I, you think about that. And, and, and to me, secret disciple is almost like an oxymoron. 
when you look at what, like we just pointed out in Matthew 16, 24, and we're going to notice another, another, a, a number of other scriptures, how can you be a disciple, a true, genuine disciple of Jesus Christ, and then keep it to yourself, right? For example, how can we be the salt of the earth that Jesus calls us to be in Matthew 5, 13, and a light unto the world, uh, you remember a city that sets on a hill that cannot be hidden, Men don't light a lamp and then put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand. Why? That it may give light to all in the house. Therefore, what? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Got to know it. Got to see it. Observe it. And glorify your Father in heaven. So how in the world can you and I, how can we possibly be a salt, an influence in, in this world, and a light in them see our good works if we're keeping it to ourselves? that we're a Christian, that we're a member of the body of Christ. How can we confess Christ before others if we are a secret disciple? You know, Jesus said there in Matthew 10, and Will read it for us a short while ago in our scripture reading this evening, but in Matthew chapter 10 in verses 32 and 33, Therefore, Whoever confesses me or acknowledges me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. But the expectation is, as a follower of Jesus, that we would be willing to confess him before others. That we're going to talk about him before others. But that's not going to happen if we're keeping our discipleship a secret from everyone. That we're keeping it on the down low, right? That we're keeping it just to ourselves, between us and God. That, that won't work. How, how can we possibly teach the lost the gospel also if we're secret disciples? I know that, you know, we, we know that the, the first century disciples, first century apostles, the Christians, they were called upon to do that, to spread the gospel, right? You, th you think about a passage like Matthew 28, 19, which we use this morning at near the end of our lesson in, in Haggai chapter 2. But there, Jesus says to his disciples then, go therefore and make disciples. So he, he tells his present disciples, go make other disciples and then baptize them once they've been taught right, by you, the gospel of Christ. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then continue to teach them to observe all things I've commanded you in verse 20. Well, how can we make disciples if we ourselves are secretive about our own discipleship? Well, we can't. We cannot. And so lost souls then remain lost if there's a bunch of Disciples who are being secretive about their discipleship. You see that? Secret disciples cannot go out and then therefore make more disciples. And how can you contend earnestly for the faith if no one knows you're a Christian? Is it likely that a secret disciple, someone who's a Christian but they, others around them don't know it. Is it likely that in, at school, in the workplace, in the community, that we're going to speak up and contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints? Probably not very likely if we're secretive about being a follower of Jesus Christ. So that begs the question, why are some secret disciples? Well, why was Joseph for a period of time a secret disciple? The text tells us, doesn't it? You go back to John 19 and verse 38, it, tell, it told us right there. He was afraid, fearful of others. That's a big one. That's a big one. Put it at the top of the list, we have it on top of our list tonight. Joseph of Arimathea was fearful of the Jews. And I might be tempted to say in some ways for good reason. Remember, he's a prominent member of the council, the Sanhedrin council. And I believe, and it, this was a late thought as I'm sitting in my seat, and I'm like, oh yeah, I should have looked that up. But 
I'm thinking there were 70 or 72 that made up the Sanhedrin Council. But it's made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. And you think about that. You had him and we know Nicodemus. And I don't know if anybody else, Scripture doesn't tell us. Because we know the, the, the largest portion of the, in, the fiercest enemies of Christ came from the council, came from the Pharisees. That's who would stand before the high priest in that council before he was crucified, right? Led away to Pilate. You think about that. If that's right, if that's about 70, 72, then that means <laughs> you're in the vast minority. And you know it's this body that you're a part of is filled with men that envy Jesus and hate him and have been seeking to destroy him for about three years. And if they find out that I believe in him, in fact, I'm a disciple of his, what are they going to do to me and my family? I'm not saying that excuses it, but I can appreciate, I think, the fear there. Now, we're not to fear any man. Easier said and done, but we're not to fear any man. Will also read this scripture back in Matthew chapter 10. This is where we began in our scripture reading tonight. Matthew 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body. Well, that's don't fear men. But cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear God, but don't fear men. They can't touch or affect the destination, the eternal destination of your soul or spirit. They can take your life, and that, I know, can seem scary, but they can't affect you going to heaven or hell. That, that's you being loyal to the Lord till you take your last breath. There's a passage in the book of Hebrews there in chapter 13 that I referenced this morning that we didn't read, but one of the things that the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 13 and verse um, 6 is so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? Again, easier said than done, but that needs to be our mindset and our attitude. I will not fear, what can man do to me? Well, he can kill me, he can persecute me, he can torture me, but he can't take away my safety in the Lord and my security in the Lord. The wise man said in Proverbs 29 and verse 25, the fear of man brings a snare or a trap. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe, he says. And it does. The fear of men, it does ensnare us and it does bring a trap. But if we'll trust the Lord with all our heart, then we need, we need not fear any man. And we need to remember that God has not given you and he's not given me, the Bible says, a spirit of fear. Now the devil wants you and me to be afraid because then we'll be secretive, we'll be quiet. We won't speak out, right? We'll be afraid. God, though, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1 and verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a power and of love and of sound mind. Isn't that how your Bible reads? Well, do you believe that or not? Yeah, do we amen that or not? We should amen that. We should agree. That, that's what God's inspired word says. He's not given me. He's not giving you a spirit of fear. He doesn't want us to be fearful. He wants us uh, not to be overconfident, but he wants us to put our confidence in him and his word and the power of his word. And so I'm going to say at the end of this, let us be like Joseph. Not, the, not the, the period where he was being a disciple, but secretly. But what does he end up doing? And, it, and it's interesting at the time that he kind of comes out of the shadows. It's when they just murdered the Son of God. And he didn't consent, the, the scriptures tell us. He did not consent to his death. And what's he do? Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. You think any of his buddies on the council found out about that? I suspect so. You think there was any fallout that we're not told about in Scripture because of what he and Nicodemus did? I suspect so. 
You think about these same group of men on the council, they came after Peter and John hard in Acts 4, arrested them, the, all the apostles in Acts 5. You think they just left, left their, their fellow council members alone? I mean, again, some speculation, but just what we see in Scripture. I doubt they applauded them and said, that, good job for taking care of, of his body the way you did. But the New King James Version says, taking courage. The ESV reads very similar. The New American Standard Bible says, gathered up courage. So what do you do? It's not that we never have fear. It's that we don't give in to our fear. It's overcoming it. It's pushing through it. And it's taking courage. It's gathering up courage. God hasn't given us that spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power, love, and discipline. And so he gathered up his courage. And so we've got to gather up our courage if we've been fearful at work or at school or in certain settings and situations that we find ourselves in with non-Christians and pray to God and trust in God and gather up our courage and, and speak up and, and not keep our discipleship a secret. So why are some secret disciples? Another th point of consideration is seek approval and acceptance. We seek approval and acceptance of others. And we don't want to be excluded. We don't want to be shunned. We want to be welcomed. And notice with me in, in John chapter 12, in verses 42 and 43. John 12, 42 and 43. Now this would give me a little bit more pause. Perhaps some of these rulers of the Jews spoken of here were also on the council. Because we have rulers here. It doesn't say they're part of the council, but we have rulers uh, of the Jews. We have the Pharisees. Or excuse me, of the, excuse me of, among, even among the rulers, many believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, it says, they did not confess him. Lest what? Lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than they loved the praise of God. I think that's a big factor. Yeah, you have the fear factor here mixed with this, Right? And so were they secret believers? Yeah, they were secret believers. They believed in Jesus. Well, what do you think they believed in Jesus about? Well, they had heard his teachings. They had seen many of his miracles, no doubt. And maybe like Nicodemus, John 3, had concluded, no man can do the signs you do unless God is with him. So we have some believers here, and I say believers, demons believe in Jesus, so don't run with that and get too, too carried away. I don't mean obedient, but they believed it. The text says they believed in him, right? Just like demons believe in God and tremble, but they stay demons. And what did they do? Well, they didn't come out and confess him. They didn't do Matthew 10, 32, right? Didn't necessarily mean they went everywhere, verse 33 of Matthew 10, and denied him, but they didn't come out and confess and acknowledge, yes, we believe in him, and we, we agree with what he's teaching, and we believe he's the Christ, the Son of God. No, they didn't do that. But here's a big motivation. They didn't want to be, lest they be put out of the synagogue, and they didn't want to lose that approval and acceptance in society. Now you go back to Joseph of Arimathea, and he was a secret disciple, John 19, 38, because of, he feared the Jews. And we already talked about that a little bit, but here's another aspect of that. What would have happened to him? If others know that you're a, a disciple of Jesus... Is your job at risk? Is your social standing at risk to be lost? Because we might look at Joseph and, and just kind of shake our heads. Man, I can't believe he was a secret disciple. But you think about what was at risk for him. And again, it's not to dismiss and excuse it, but it's to I hopefully better appreciate that for many of us, I don't think our job would be at risk if others knew we were a Christian. 
that we believed in God. Uh, some may look down upon it. Your boss may not like it. Would he fire you? And would, and would you lose all standing in your community like a Jew would? And the Pharisees said, anybody who confesses him as, as the Christ will be put out of the synagogue. And that affected all aspects of your life. Well, that's what happened to the man in John 9, the man who'd been born blind. They, they, the Pharisees put him out of the synagogue because he did confess Jesus. He did speak up. You know, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 26, Jesus said there, he pronounced some woes, but woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. If everyone who knows you, likes you, and you always have their approval, there may be something wrong. Now, here's the thing. We want other people to like us. I want other people to like me. I want to get along with everyone. But listen, if we're following the teachings of Christ, not everyone's going to like us. Jesus says, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. John 15. Paul said, if you live a godly life, you will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12. It goes with the territory. So if we never have any friction and any pushback from those in the world, then maybe we're being secretive about our discipleship. But it's not a good thing if, whoa, if all men speak well of you. That, that's what they did with the false prophets who spoke the smooth things, and it sounded good. Remember what Paul said in Galatians 1? Of course, verses 6 through 9, he expressed how he was marveling and so surprised that they turned away to a different gospel. He says, which is not another, but some perverted, distorted. And he says about if anyone comes to you and preach a different gospel, let him be accursed. But then in verse 10 he says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I, do I seek to please men? Here we go. For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. If that's what I was all about, I'm just trying to be a men pleaser, a man pleaser. I want everybody to like me and love me. Paul said I wouldn't be a bondservant of Christ. It just wouldn't work out for me to do that. Also notice what he said in his first epistle to the saints in Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, notice now, not as pleasing men, but God. And why should we worry about pleasing God? He's the one who tests our hearts. He's the one who will judge us in the last day. I don't need to always be, wor be worrying and concerned with what others are going to say, what others are going to think. If it's the truth, and I'm striving to speak that truth in love and humility, but boldly, then let the chips fall where they may. We need to be about, about pleasing our Lord and Savior and about pleasing our Heavenly Father, not about pleasing men out here. Again, that's easier said than done when we find ourselves in a situation where we feel some pressure or some maybe fear creep up in our heart. We need to take courage, and we don't, we don't need to worry about seeking the approval and acceptance of men. Let's, get, let's be worried about pleasing our Heavenly Father. Why are some secret disciples? Sometimes it boils down to maybe being ashamed of the gospel message. Now, Jesus said very clearly and quite bluntly in Mark chapter 8 and in verse 38, Mark 8, verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me, in my words, and they go hand in hand, Jesus and his words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, and we live in an adulterous and sinful generation too, don't we? Of whom the Son of Man, excuse me, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You know, Paul said, I'm not ashamed, right? In Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the words of Jesus or Jesus himself. For it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. We already mentioned 2 Timothy 1.7, but we'll include verse 8 this time. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of, of power and love and sound mind. Therefore, verse 8, 
Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, Paul says to Timothy. Therefore, since God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind, do not be ashamed of what? The testimony of the Lord Jesus. Well, what's the testimony? The gospel, the teachings, the confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Now, what are some things about the gospel message, the contents, that might give us pause because we already know what the majority have been taught and what they think and what they'll say and the pushback we'll receive or how people might get real upset and the two topics we have to leave alone are politics and religion. Well, you can leave politics out of it, but you can't leave faith out of it if you're going to be a genuine disciple of Jesus. Maybe it's the necessity of baptism. I hope you're not ashamed of that, but in our conversations with others, do we not bring it up because we know what they might say or we think we know what they might say? Well, the lost need to be taught what the Bible says. It's not about what my personal beliefs. It's about what, is, what does the gospel of Christ teach? Acts 2.38, it's for the remission of sins. Maybe it's this one, the, that there's only one true church we know that we have many friends out here in the Cookville and Upper Cumberland area and beyond who their view of, of, of the church is more all-encompassing, right? There's just many believers out here. There's many Christians that just go to different churches and, hey, we're all headed to the same place. Well, the Bible says, no, there's just one true church, and it, it's the Lord's church. There's just one body. He built his church, not his churches, Matthew 16, 18. Maybe it's this one, that we don't use mechanical instruments in our worship. A lot of people come here or know about majority churches of Christ, and they sometimes say, well, y'all don't, don't have music in, in your church, in your worship. You don't believe in music. Well, yeah, we believe in music. We believe in what's authorized New Testament, that music, a cappella, vocal and making melody in our hearts the Lord, the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And it would be an addition to what God has said and specified, the Lord has specified in His Word, if we took it upon ourselves to add mechanical instruments of music. But we know by far the majority of churches out here, they, they have a lot of instruments that they use in their worship. Well, we ought not to be ashamed of that. That's what the New Testament teaches and yes, it matters how we say it and express it, but we need to say it and we need to express it. We need to acknowledge it and not be ashamed of that message of what's, what music is authorized in the New Testament. Sexual purity. Something that certainly ought not to be ashamed of, but not be ashamed to, to, to speak about that. And there's many scriptures that, that talk, about on this, talk about this subject, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is one of those. And if you'll notice in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, please. Paul says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, you should abstain from, fornic from fornication, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles, like those in the world who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness he's called us. We talked about this this past Wednesday night in our home and family study with Jason. We had a great discussion and great comments as well from the class members on a very important subject. We know the world is very promiscuous, that they even will laugh and uh, excuse me, ridicule and, and mock and laugh at, 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 at you if, if you have kept your sexual purity, that you're saving yourself for your future mate and spouse as we need to do and must do and should do. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed is undefiled. That's where God placed that sexual relationship and union. Fornicators and adulterers, though, God will judge. But don't be ashamed of that. And to, to say that and state that and make that very clear to, 
the person as well, especially to the one you're dating, sexual purity and the steps and measures you're going to take when you're dating, even dating a fellow Christian, you're going to keep yourselves pure in that way. But don't be ashamed of it in, in, with your worldly friends, co-workers, fellow students. Don't be ashamed of the gospel message on that. Or abstaining from drinking parties. Peter will even say they think it's strange that you don't run with them in the same flood of dissipation or excess. Uh, of, of drunkenness and revelries and drinking parties that you don't pr partake of alcohol. Uh, don't be ashamed of that. It's not, you don't need to boast about it, but don't be ashamed of it because of what the Bible teaches about that. And take your stand. But I think some kind of keep it, we kind of keep it maybe to ourselves because, again, I don't think we would think, well, I'm ashamed of it, but the way we behave and keep it to ourselves, we're acting like we're ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, the words of Christ. Let's not be. And then, why are some secret disciples? They possess a desire for worldly things. There's too much of a worldly mindset there, I'm afraid, with some of God's people. And in 1 John chapter 2, notice with me there, in a familiar passage, please, uh, 1 John 2, uh, verses 15 through 17. <clears throat> John writes, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, here are these enticements, these allurements that, that call us, that beckon us, the lust of the eyes the, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, lust is strong desire. And here's strong desire for things that are sinful out here, that the world just goes headlong into. And they, they welcome it. They, they, when they're enticed by it, they just give in to it. But there are those allurements and enticements for the children of God that have been called to holiness. Remember 1 Thessalonians 4? We've been called to purity, and we're to abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Go back to our 1 Peter study there in 1 Peter chapter uh, 2. Well, Jesus said, or in Luke, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 and verse 15, one aspect of worldliness is a materialistic mindset, covetousness, Right? You remember the two brothers arguing over the inheritance, over money? And so he said, beware, take heed uh, of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the, the abundance of the things that he possesses. Take heed, beware. You've got to beware of covetousness, for one's life, his life, your life, my life, does not consist in the abundance of the things we possess. That's not what life is about. It's about fearing God and keeping His commandments. It's about being good stewards of, that thing, of those things He has blessed us with, right? And Jesus says no man can serve two masters, right? He'll love one, he'll hate the other, he'll be loyal to one, he'll be disloyal to the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. The mammon there is the Aramaic word for wealth personified. You can't serve God in money and riches, but some tried to. Some disciples of Christ continue to be conformed to the world instead of being transformed by the will of God. That's what Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says. <clears throat> Notice with me in your Bibles, though, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Here's the message to you and me as a Christian, as a disciple of Christ, and do not be conformed to this world. Now, there's many ways that we could be guilty of being conformed to this world, right? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so, worldly clothing, worldly clothing, dressing like the world, in modesty. Do not be conformed to this world in that aspect. Worldly speech. The words we use, the phrases we use, very similar, if not identical at times, 
maybe to those who are unbelievers, non-believers in the world, worldly entertainment, watching things, viewing things that are no different from what the world watches, that content that is ungodly, that's not fit for a saint to be feeding upon, for our children to be feeding upon, worldly entertainment. And, of course, there's other things besides just watching that fits into the realm of entertainment, music and video games and what have you. Uh, worldly friends. Sometimes that, that mindset in, in, within a disciple of Christ, we begin to associate with more so with people in the world than those in the church, and we need to be mindful of that. We can have friends, obviously, that are not Christians, and we need to be a salt and a light to them and be an influence to them and not let them in a negative way be, be influencing us. But we need to be thinking about that. Worldly pursuits. Again, maybe it's the laying up treasures on earth. That maybe it's that those brothers in Luke 12 that take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. But sometimes it's just a worldly mindset. Remember what Paul said near the, near the end of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4 about a brother in Christ that had been a co-laborer of his. His name was Demas. He's talking about everybody who's left him, and, and he said, Demas has forsaken me. Why? Having loved this present world. Having loved this present world. Now, it wasn't like other brothers. He mentioned this brother departed for this place, Dalmatia. This brother departed here. With Demas, it was he's forsaken me having loved this present world. Now, he doesn't go into all the details of what aspects of the world, and I don't guess it really matters, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, but if it can happen to Demas, it can happen to me, it can happen to you. Here is a co-laborer, the Apostle Paul, that in the book of Colossians on Philemon, he spoke highly of, and how this must have broken Paul's heart near the end of his life, what happened to Demas. And so let's take heed, lest we fall. James chapter 4, verse 4, Do you not know that friendship with the world is what? Enmity with God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Again, James 4, verse 4. So let me ask you again, are you a secret disciple? Don't, do not be ashamed of the Lord or of His teachings. Sometimes we sing the hymn 530. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend His cause, maintain the honor of His word, the glory of His cross. May we all sincerely believe that, be convicted of that. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend His cause. Not just sing those words, but mean it and live it in our lives. And so don't be ashamed of the Lord. Don't be ashamed of His teachings, of the testimony of the Lord. And then go and tell others the gospel of salvation, the good news of salvation. Confess Christ before men. Don't keep your discipleship, being a Christian, a secret before others. We're told to go, we're told to be a salt, we're told to be a light, we're told to confess, we're told to be ready to give an answer. That's why I think it's almost like an oxymoron, secret and secret disciple. They just don't go together. And so may God help us, may God strengthen us, each one of us, to be the disciple he calls us to be and to go and make other disciples of those that we meet. If you're not yet a disciple of Christ, then we would want you to become one. More importantly, the Lord would want you to become a follower of his. And why would you not want to be? You can't serve two masters. You boil it down, we're either following Satan, the devil, or we're following the Lord. It's either we're walking in the light or we're walking in darkness. There's not a third option there, right? It's one or the other. And Jesus invites you to come to him, but you have to desire it. Can't make you, can't force you, wouldn't do it, wouldn't do any good. But Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, we hope you do. We hope you do long to follow Jesus that you believe in Him, that He's the Christ, the Son of God, that you're willing to repent of your sins, and confess your faith in Him, 
and then to be baptized into him for the remission of your sins. We stand ready and happy to assist you in that great decision if you're ready to follow Jesus. And if you are a disciple of Christ already, as many here are, but there's sin in your life, then repent of that and come back to the Lord. Be faithful to him. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, let it be known as we stand and as we sing.